Ephesians chapter 6, our scripture reading. We'll look at those verses again here in just a moment. Good to see everybody here today. Good to have visitors with us. Good to have some of our traveling folks back. Bob and Jackie wanted me to let you know that they miss you and love you and hope to be down here with us before too long. Uh, my mother-in-law has to have a little bit of surgery to address uh, an issue with her thyroid which may complicate their plans to come down here. We'll keep you posted, but they did want me to be sure to pass on their love to you guys. Uh, I want to use this opportunity to invite all of you one more time who are here local to come and participate in a book club that will meet at my house for the first meeting tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. We're going to read a book called The Screwtape Letters, by C.S. Lewis. Just out of curiosity, how many of you have ever read this book before? So you see a lot of you have a reason to come because you haven't read it before. If you want to know what it's about, <clears throat> the screw tape is the name of a demon. And this book is written as a series of letters from a demon named Screwtape to his nephew, whose name is Wormwood, who is trying to capture the soul of someone. And screw tape is giving Wormwood advice into how he can try to take the soul of this person. In other words, it's like having the devil's playbook. And what C.S. Lewis is trying to do in this book is to get us to think about the different ways the devil tries to get at us, which is what the scripture reading was about this morning here in Ephesians 6 and verse 10. <laughs> Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. And while, of course, it's true that screw tape is a piece of fiction, what is not fictional is the reality that you and I as Christians in our fight as Christians are actually in a fight against evil, dark spiritual forces. Verse 12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. That's why it is so important for us to know the schemes of the devil. Although, as uh, an example of my childhood growing up on the King James Version, I entitled today's lesson, The Wiles of the Devil. Because instead of schemes, the old King James Version says, The Wiles of the Devil. And when Ed asked me for the title for the lesson, that's what popped out of my mind. Although, in our day and time, it would be better to use the word schemes. We're not so familiar with the word wiles, Although there is actually a celebrity that bears the name Wiles, and that's this guy right here. Although I'm actually worried, do you folks up here, do you know who this is, right? Wiley Coyote. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I don't know if there's a generation gap issue here this morning or not. But Wiley Coyote, well, why is he called Wiley? Well, because he's always plotting, he's always scheming to try to get the roadrunner. And that's why the King James Version warned about the wiles of the devil, because the devil is always plotting, he's always scheming to try to get us. And I can't think of a better place for us to look in the Bible to understand just exactly what those schemes or wiles are that the devil uses to attack us then by looking at the most dramatic story of the temptations of the devil in all of Scripture, and that is the story of Jesus' temptation. So I want you to turn now with me to the Gospel of Luke, to Luke chapter 4, as I try to say a few things to set up the context of the story of the temptation. I've talked about the temptation in several classes and sermons with you, so I don't want to belabor a lot of these points. But for those of you visiting, and by way of reminder for our regulars, here's some things to consider as the context of the story of the temptation. In both Matthew and in Luke, the temptation is found in the fourth chapter. And in both Gospels, the story of the temptation is found after the story of the baptism of Jesus. Why is that significant? Well, what does God say about Jesus at his baptism? This is my son, my beloved son, with whom I'm well pleased. 
It's at the baptism of Jesus that he is proclaimed to be the son of God. Well, in the temptation, how does the devil preface his temptation? If you are the son of God. And in the case of the Gospel of Luke, there's one more phrase, the Son of God, that we ought to pay attention to. It's in the account just before the temptation in chapter 4, the genealogy at the end of Luke chapter 3, which concludes in verse 38, the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the Son of God. And now we have Luke's account of the temptation, which focuses on Jesus as the Son of God. And Luke is saying, here are two sons of God. Adam and Jesus. Adam, the son of God, who's in a paradise. He's in a garden. He's tempted to eat what he should not. What kind of son is he going to be compared to Jesus, the son of God, who's not in a paradise, so a wonderful garden. He's in a barren, desolate wilderness, but he's also tempted to eat. Will he be a faithful son of God or not? That's Luke's account. Now, if you go with me over to Matthew's account, and that's actually where we'll spend the rest of our time today, Matthew has another frame of reference in mind. And that frame of reference takes us back to the second chapter of Matthew, when Matthew describes the return of Jesus and his family from Egypt, and explains in Matthew chapter 2, and in verse 15, this was to fulfill what the Lord has spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. In fact, I showed you that passage from Hosea last week when I talked with you about parents of prodigals and I was making the point to you that God the Father has prodigals, that Israel itself was a prodigal. And, and this is the passage I showed you from Hosea 11 where God speaks of Israel as his son. In fact, in Exodus 4, when God appeared to Moses and said, go to Pharaoh, he said, I want you to go tell him Israel is my firstborn son. So now we have another son of God to think of. So here you have Israel, the son of God, in Egypt, threatened by a foreign dictator, comes through the waters of the Red Sea, and immediately goes into the wilderness for 40 years. Jesus, the son of God, is in Egypt. His life has been threatened by a foreign tyrant. He has come through the waters of baptism, declared to be the son of God. And now, according to Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1, he goes into the wilderness where he is going to hunger, not for 40 years, but for 40 days. So Luke wants us to see Jesus as the son of God in contrast to Adam. Matthew wants us to see Jesus as the Son of God in contrast to Israel itself, which in part explains why in all three of these temptations we're about to study, each time Jesus not simply quotes from Scripture, he quotes from one book of the Old Testament, the book of Deuteronomy given to Israel, the Son of God, as it had finished its 40 years in the wilderness to encourage them to be faithful to God. And now the Son of God, Jesus, having finished his 40 days in the wilderness, is going to draw from that same book all three times as he deals with the temptation of the devil. So if you want to think about who Jesus is in, in the Gospel of Matthew, a lot of us who attended Florida College know that the highest honor Florida College bestows is the honor of Mr. and Mrs. Florida College. And the person who is chosen as Mr. and Miss Florida College are chosen to be that because even though they're not the whole college, they embody the values of the college. They are like the personification of the college, like Miss America or Miss Universe. Well, Jesus is the personification. He is the embodiment of Israel itself, the Son of God that Israel was supposed to be. So with that background in mind, let's dig in here more carefully. Verse 1 says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness. Notice Jesus isn't cornered. He is led by the Spirit to take the devil on, to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Now, you might think of the wilderness as, you know, a wonderful, beautiful landscape. But the wilderness of Judea is not that. Here's a picture from my old teacher or old colleague, Farrell Jenkins' website. That's the wilderness of Judea. It is barren 
It is desolate. And it is there that Jesus goes having hungered, for, fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And it is there that the tempter begins his assault. Verse 3, the tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, and I want you to be clear here, Satan is not doubting whether Jesus is the son of God. That's not the point at all. To the contrary, he knows good and well that Jesus is the son of God. And what he's saying is in view of that, since you are the son of God, command these stones, and there's a lot of them, to become loaves of bread. Precisely because Satan knows that Jesus is the Son of God, he tempts him to do something only the Son of God could do, miraculously change stones to bread. I mean, if the devil popped up here this morning and said, Shane, go outside, turn some of those stones to bread, that's no temptation at all. I can't do it. It's not even conceivable. It's not in my power. It's precisely because Jesus could do this that the devil is tempting him as the Son of God, go turn stones to bread. But why is this a temptation? I mean, not only could Jesus do this, he did do this. In the Gospel of Mark, he did it twice, once for 5,000 and once for 4,000. Not only that, there's nothing wrong with Jesus eating. I mean, we even know at his resurrection that out on the beach, he ate fish with his disciples in one of his appearances. So why is this a temptation to sin? Well, ordinarily, there is no problem with Jesus eating unless he is refraining from eating for a purpose. Unless he's refraining from eating for the purpose of pleasing his father out of devotion to God. And that's exactly what's going on here. And the way we know that is because of the passage Jesus is going to quote. It's from Deuteronomy chapter 8, where the Lord explains to Israel why he dealt with them the previous 40 years in the wilderness as he did. You shall remember the whole way the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. God is saying to Israel, I permitted you to go hungry, to test you, to humble you, to make you rely on me. And if Jesus has now come to personify Israel, then that helps us to understand why is he going hungry? Why is he refraining from eating? Because he is also using this as a time to humble himself, to make himself reliant on the Father rather than himself. And in that circumstance, to use his own power to feed himself would be wrong because the whole point of this is to refrain from serving himself so the reason this is a temptation is because the devil is trying to entice Jesus to make use of his own power to please himself after all you're the son of God don't you think God wants you to be happy and that, I would suggest, ladies and gentlemen, is the first scheme of the devil we need to be on guard against. God wants me to be happy, doesn't he? I mean, I'm the son of God. He just said so. What would be so wrong with me making a little piece of bread here? I bet he, Jesus could have even made a cinnamon roll as good as one of Stephanie's from those stones. What's the big problem? Why is it? I bet he could even make one of those Dunkin' Donut glazed donuts if he wanted to. Doesn't he deserve the right to enjoy something sweet, something wonderful, something? I'm sorry, I got to get my mind back here focused on the issue at hand. It is this scheme of the devil, this wild of the devil, that he loves to use to entice us away from God. Well, don't you think God wants you to be happy? Certainly among my friends who love God and yet are opting to engage in same-sex relationships, this is by far the most common justification I hear them give. Well, doesn't God want me to be happy? Why can't I do this? 
And in following that line of thought, all they're really doing is simply following the lead of decades of heterosexuals saying, well, if I don't like the person I'm married to, if I'm not happy in my marriage, why can't I just divorce them and get somebody else? Doesn't God want me to be happy? Even though Jesus himself, a few chapters later, in Matthew chapter 19, states very clearly what God's will is for marriage. When he says in verse 5, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, so they are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And when the disciples want to know, or the Pharisees want to know, well, then why did Moses say you could get divorced? Jesus said, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. Jesus says, if you're married to someone, and you just decide you don't want to be married anymore because you want to be happy, and you divorce them and you marry somebody else, you are in fact committing adultery. And the only exception to that is if your spouse has been unfaithful. In that sense, the adultery has already been committed. And I know when you read this passage in our society, it's like a splash of ice cold water to the face, given the way that in our culture we treat marriage. I'll just have you know that in the time of Jesus, it was even more countercultural because divorce was even easier in the first century than it was in our own. The demands of Jesus have always cut against the grain of culture. And this is a prime example. The devil loves to use the enticement of, don't you think God wants you to be happy, to lure us away from our obedience to the Father. But here is the thing. I would almost say, if you don't remember anything else I say, say this, except I'm only a third of the way through the sermon. So there's a lot more I want you to remember. But if there is anything I would want you to remember about this point, it is this. Here is the irony. God does want you to be happy. He wants you to be happier than you could ever possibly imagine. He just wants you to understand what true happiness consists of. And what true happiness consists of is what Jesus explains here in verse 4. He answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Because by doing God's will, you will have God, and you will have God not just for a short period of time, like you would enjoy a piece of bread made from stone or a few moments of sexual gratification, if you have God, you will have him forever. Now that is happiness. That's why John warns us in 1 John chapter 2, do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away. All of these things you think are your source of happiness are temporary, along with its desires. But listen, whoever does the will of God abides forever. God wants you to be happy forever in him. And that's why you're willing to forego the happiness the devil tries to scheme and, and uh, cause you to turn away from God with. I just want you to see this, especially my young friends. When you hear me preach against divorce, when you hear me preach against same-sex relationships, when you hear me preach against greed, this is not hate, it is love. Because you are being called to learn from Jesus to find that your true happiness is in God. Well, the devil's not done. He's a lot like Wiley Coyote in the sense that he just likes to keep trying. So let's go to verse 5. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. Nobody's sure exactly what part of the temple is in question here. Obviously, as you know the story, it would be some place where if you jumped off of it, by the time you hit the ground, you would be seriously injured if not killed without divine intervention, which is exactly what the devil brings up. Verse 6, he said to him, if you're the son of God, and again, this is not, I don't know if you are or not, it's because you are, since that is the case, throw yourself down. 
For it is written. Now remember, what did Jesus just say man lives by? The word of God. So as if the accuser says, okay, you want to live by the word of God? Let's just open it up. And here's what it says. So you want to see where the devil's quoting from here? Go back with me to Psalm 91. Psalm 91 which sometimes would be categorized. You know, like our songbook has invitation songs, Lord's Supper songs, praise songs. This would be a song of confidence, a psalm designed to inspire confidence in you, in God. And notice how Psalm 91 begins. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Can you imagine any place in the world where any Israelite would have felt more safe and secure in the shelter of God than in the temple? Where did Satan just take Jesus? And then as you read down through this psalm, it is a beautiful set of promises of God rescuing his beloved from danger. For example, verse 9, Because you've made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High who's my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you, no plague shall come near your tent. And then here are the verses the devil quotes. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus, you're the Son of God. Look at this promise God made in the temple. Make him show it. Make him prove his word. Make him keep his promise. Jump off of here and let's see if he'll send his angels to bear you up. In other words, it's not just simply that God wants me to be happy. God owes it to me to be happy. God owes it to you to rescue you. He promised it. Now, before you dismiss this scheme as a scheme you would never fall for, God owes happiness to me. Let me ask you a couple of questions. Have you ever asked God for something, and then when you didn't get it, resent him because you didn't? I don't just mean be sad that it didn't happen. I don't just mean be disappointed you didn't get it. I mean you're angry with God. I am. Here's another question. Have you ever seen somebody else receive a blessing from God and you resent the fact they got a blessing that you did not? Envy them. Resent them. And become angry. Do you see that behind both of those responses is a mindset of entitlement? If I pray for something, I'm entitled to get it. If so-and-so gets a blessing, I ought to get one as well. God owes me. That's the avenue the devil is using here. Now, just exactly what do we think God does owe us? I mean, we are his creatures. In him we live and move and have our very being. Every moment of our existence we owe to God. In fact, I saw this Babylon Bee headline one time. What has God ever done for me? Asks man breathing air. It's pretty funny. If you go on and read the story, it says this. Sources confirm that local free thinker Jared Olson called into question the absurd idea that God's ever done anything for him, all while inhaling oxygen and exhaling carbon dioxide in a complex process well beyond his mind's capability of understanding in its entirety. So we stay what God owes me, and we don't even realize we can't even say that without owing God our sheer existence and breath of life. God does not owe us anything. We owe him everything, and whatever blessings we receive should be accepted with humble thanks, like we talked about in our singing on Wednesday night. And if others receive blessings, we should rejoice with those who rejoice. Now somebody says, well, wait a minute, didn't God make promises? That's, of course, the devil's ploy here, right? God made promises. Consider what Jesus says in verse 7. Jesus said to him, again it is written. Again it is written. 
Yes, it is true that Psalm 91 contains a great promise. But what Jesus is saying, you've got to understand, you cannot take a promise God makes in one passage, isolate it from that passage, absolutize it, and treat it as if it's some ironclad guarantee that God is going to be like a celestial Santa Claus, and all you've got to do is make out your list and expect him to pop down the chimney and put everything you want under the tree. You have to look at all that God says because that's what you do in a relationship. Here's an illustration. I would bet that every parent here has had one of those tender moments with your children, especially when they're quite young, like I remember having with my mom. When you might be with your child rocking them or holding them one day, and the child may even ask, Mom, Dad, do you love me? And you say to your child, I love you so much. I would do anything in the world for you. Now, when you said that, did your child jump up and say, Oh, yeah? Well, I'm going to go over to the Skyway Bridge and jump off. Let's see if you'll do anything for me. Go and save me. Well, that would be ridiculous. What kind of child would do that? That's not the point of that exchange at all. Your parent is just reassuring you of their love. And what a son, a proper response of a son is to be grateful, not to say, oh yeah, prove it. That's treating God as if he's the slave and we're the master instead of God being the father and us his son, the son in whom he's well pleased. And so Jesus says in verse 7, again it is written, you shall not put your Lord to the, the Lord your God to the test. The reality is some things we ask God for are just bad for us. He's not going to give them to us because he loves us. And other times we ask God for things and he gives us something even better and not just what we ask. And other times he may say no, but the point is in none of those circumstances does God owe us. He isn't our slave. He isn't our heavenly ATM machine that we just put the card of prayer in and expect him to spit out blessings. We're children. He's our Father, and we love Him. And if you love someone, you don't make them jump through hoops to prove it. Well, one more avenue. Kind of like, you know, Wiley Coyote always seems like he's up on the cliff. High. You'd think he would have learned after a while, stay away from heights, right? It just always seems to come back to haunt him. But anyway, we're going to go to a height here. Verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I think we probably should see this as a visionary experience. And he said to him, verse 9, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. This raises a lot of questions. First of all, could the devil give what he promised, the kingdoms of the world and their glory? Well, maybe. I mean, in other places, Jesus calls him the ruler of this world. And yet, on the other hand, we have to realize he was a ruler only in the sense that Stalin ruled much of Europe as, a, a, as an unworthy ruler, as the not rightful ruler who has invaded and captured what doesn't really belong to him. The other thing we've got to consider is the devil's a liar. So just because he promises he can do something doesn't mean he can. I mean, in Psalm 2, it's pretty clear in the language here that it is God who will make the son, the king, and the nations, the heritage, and the possession of the ends of the earth. So I'm not sure Satan could do what he promised. Another question here is, does Satan know at this point that Jesus is going to become king, but first going to suffer on the cross? And is he trying to entice him by saying, hey, you can be a king without the cross? To be honest, I don't really think Satan knows exactly what's about to happen. Because of this passage in 1 Corinthians 2, where Paul says in verse 8, none of the rulers understood the mystery of what God was going to do in Christ. Whether Satan understood or not, I think Jesus clearly did, though, which would have made this the temptation that it is. Did you notice, though, something interesting about the way Satan begins this temptation? Unlike the first two, when he begins by saying, if you're the son of God, he doesn't say that this time. Because this temptation is going to be different. In the first two instances, what he's saying is, hey, you're God's son. You ought to be happy. He owes it to you to be happy. But now the temptation is, maybe you should find happiness without God altogether. 
I can be happy without God. Rather than worshiping God, you should worship me. Now, ironically, you know what happens to everybody who says, I don't need God to be happy? They end up serving another God. They turn something else into a God. They turn sex into a God, or money into a God, or power into a God, or fame into a God, or hate into a God. It just becomes the all-consuming focus of their life that takes priority over everyone and everything else. But here's the other thing that happens. They also become enslaved to those gods. They become slaves controlled by lust, controlled by greed, controlled by ambition, controlled by popularity, controlled by drugs, controlled by bitterness. And the really tragic thing is, when you look at this happen, you actually watch them shrink away from their full humanity because they have become slaves of a bitter and angry tyrant. Notice how Jesus responded in verse 10. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and only shall you him only shall you serve. Here is the key point Jesus raises here. The devil just mentioned worship. He didn't say anything about service. Trying to convince Jesus that you can worship one thing and serve something else. But Jesus knows whatever it is you worship is what you will serve. If Jesus had taken the devil's enticement and fallen down and worshipped him to receive the kingdoms of the world, think about it. If Jesus is worshipping Satan, who's really serving whom? Who's really the king? It's not Jesus, it's the devil. That's why the devil is so good at what he does. He's able to entice us and promise the very thing he intends to take away from us. But Jesus understood that what you worship is also going to be what you serve. And here's what Jesus understood. Someday he's going to go to a, a mountain. And he is truly going to receive authority. Matthew tells us about it at the end of his gospel. You remember what happens in Matthew chapter 28? After Jesus' resurrection. Matthew 28 verse 18. Verse 16 says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, listen to this, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. Now, if only it was the same mountain. We'd really have something here, but we don't know what mountain it was. But he takes the disciples to the mountain, and in verse 18, Jesus said to them, All authority has been given to me. Now, by the way, what did the devil offer him? All the kingdoms of the world. Guess what God gave Jesus? All authority in heaven and on earth. God gave Jesus what he promised, and he gave him far more than the devil ever dreamed that he could. Authority in heaven and on earth. And I want you to see that God will give you a greater happiness than the deceiver ever possibly could. If only we will say to him what Jesus did. Be gone. Just make sure you understand. Jesus isn't saying, oh, I can't take it anymore. Go away, go away. That's not it at all. If we were to roughly paraphrase it, it would be, get out of here, you bumbling moron. Exactly right. <laughs> and we, when we see through the wiles of the devil, the schemes of the devil, we can send him packing. Because I will tell you this, nothing disarms the devil more than dismissing him. Early in the book, Screwtape, Screwtape says to his nephew that our best weapon is the belief of ignorant humans that there is no hope of getting rid of us except by yielding. Jesus exposes how weak that weapon really is by showing us that God wants us to be happier than we could ever make ourselves. Not because he owes us, but because he is just overflowing love. 
And if we seek our happiness in him, if we worship him and serve him, we will someday know what the psalmist meant in Psalm 16 when he said, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures evermore. And it is seeking those pleasures that will keep us immune from the wiles of the devil. And this morning, our invitation for those of you who are not Christians is why would you delay any more coming to Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who can save you and rescue you from this evil tyrant who has defeated him on the cross and in his resurrection and provide you the hope of victory? And as a child of God, I want you to be encouraged that through Jesus Christ, you can withstand the evil one. If we can help you, let us know while we sing the invitation.